Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, the aftermath of an amateur failed coup in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The whole thing played out like a really bad movie. How three Americans got as far as the presidential palace and what happens next. I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. I said enough with this broad regime, a dictatorship, a regime that has sucked our blood. In the early hours of Sunday, May 19th, Christian Malanga went live on Facebook. Felix, you out! Felix, take us! Malanga, a Congolese citizen, was raised in Utah, in the United States. He looked determined to seize power in the DRC and overthrow the government of President Felix Tshisekedi. Under Malanga's command were 50 armed men. The endeavor, though, proved short-lived. And then we see photos of Christian Malanga's corpse. This was the army speaker on television later that day. The armed forces of the Democratic Republic of Congo inform our citizens and the international community that an attempted coup d'etat has been nipped in the bud by the defense and security forces. Democratic Republic of Congo's so-called coup attempt has raised yet more questions. Question Shola Lawal has been trying to answer. I'm an independent journalist currently covering Africa and African diasporas for Al Jazeera Digital. I'm based in Berlin. Thank you for joining me, Shola. Welcome to The Take. I want to start with the morning of May 19th. Walk me through those first few hours. What happened? So the initial attack started at around 4.30 a.m. that Sunday. And the first target was the residence of of Vital Kamerhi, who is a close ally of President Shisekedi and has just been sworn in as the National Assembly Speaker, making him the number two person in the DRC. About 50 people were in that army of people who attacked. In the shootout that ensued, we understand that two people died at Vital's home, and then the group then moved towards the president's villa called Palace of the Nation, and this holds the president's offices and the official, you know, residence of the president. Mm. Although um, people should know that the president of the DRC was not in that location at the time because presidents of the DRC have for long not used these official residences because of security issues like this. So we understand that shots were being fired because, you know, of course, security guards were trying to quell this rebellion, but this army was still able to breach the president's residence and hold sway for about two to two hours, 30 minutes. Wow. And in that time, Christian Malanga, he was on live stream video on Facebook threatening the president. He's speaking in Lingala, of course, but uh, you know, basically the translation is, we were in this country enough, we're coming to take back our country. And he's also chanting, new Zaire, new Zaire, new Zaire. Zaire was the name of the Democratic Republic of Congo until 1997. And New Zaire, for people who don't know, is the name of the self, you know, declared government that this man has established for years now. Just moments after this, the DRC military moved in and they arrested people who did not resist arrest. And the people who did, apparently, Christian Malanga resisted arrest, he was killed. So much happened in a matter of just a few hours. And many were left with questions about the plot's leader. Where did Malanga come from? Why did he carry out the coup attempt? And how did he stand to gain? Christian Malanga was... Um, a man who appeared to always just have this idea of taking power in the DRC. 
He was known to authorities as far back as 2017, and he apparently had already planned a coup and then aborted it. He was born in the DRC, and then at some point his family moved to the U.S. He appears to have sought asylum in the U.S. We don't understand on what basis, but he grew up in Utah, and he had a family there. He dabbled in many businesses, even NGOs, humanitarian work, doing humanitarian work both in the U.S. and in the DRC. And at some point in 2006 or so, he came back home to the DRC and enrolled in the military. He rose to the level of captain. And he even then decided to run for parliament in 2011 or so. Unfortunately, he was tortured under the presidency of Joseph Kabila, who was the former president of DRC. It's unclear why he was detained then. But after that incident, he retreated to the United States. That's where he formed the United Congolese Party. And later on, he's said to have developed mining interests in Southern Africa, in Mozambique. And then he declared a self-government in exile called the New Zaire. And he did have a following. So he wasn't like just this isolated guy just doing crazy things. There were people at meetings, apparently, of this New Zaire movement. He also had children. He said he fathered eight children. We know one of them, Marcel Malanga, was part of the, the attempted coup. He's only 21, um, and he's one of the U.S. citizens that was arrested. So he had previously threatened on social media to overthrow the current president of the DRC, and that's according to the army. So if we knew that as far back as 2017, how was this allowed to happen? And what exactly were his grievances with the current government? For people who don't know, the DRC is mired in different crises at the moment. And at the crux of it is corruption. You know, just deep-seated corruption in the DRC has thrown that country off the rails. It has so many problems that it's just not able to realize its potential. So his grievances seem to be, look, this is a country that is rich in mineral resources. This is a country that is probably the richest in Africa. Mm. But it's also the country that is being, you know, exploited by so many different foreign bodies. And he would post on social media, like, different Bible verses alluding to himself as kind of a messiah or someone who was protected by angels. So he already had this idea of, you know, I have a purpose and I'm going to right the wrongs in my country. What's interesting about this story is the U.S. connections, because as you mentioned, he spent many formative years in the U.S. So following this attack, the U.S. ambassador to Congo, Lucy Tamlin, wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter. Rest assured that we will cooperate with the authorities of the DRC to the fullest extent possible as they investigate these criminal acts and hold accountable any American citizen involved in criminal activities. You mentioned one of the people involved was Christian Malanga's son, Who were the other Americans allegedly involved? We also know that Marcel Malanga had tried to kind of bring on board his classmates, actually, to go to the DRC with him. You know, the Associated Press talking to Marcel's classmates, talking to Marcel's family. It seemed like he gave people kind of different stories from, oh, you're coming to Africa to just enjoy with my family. That was one story. Or he told other people, you're going to be guarding my father in Africa. One person said he offered me as much as $100,000. And the only reason he didn't take that was because he wanted to stay back and be with his girlfriend for the break. One of those who actually said yes was Tyler Thompson. Tyler Thompson's parents say their son was completely unaware of any plot against the presidential palace, and they can only hope the State Department can help bring him home. I believe he's about 21, so that's the second person who has now been arrested. Mm. And the third person is Benjamin Ruben Zalman Polun. He's 36 years old, and 
He is said to be a cannabis entrepreneur. He's gotten into some troubles in, in the United States, and he is known to have had relations with Christian, you know, for several years. They did some business apparently in Mozambique involving gold mines. But Marcel and Tyler, these are young kids who kind of got roped into something that they probably didn't understand. And many of his classmates believe that, you know, Marcel, they describe him as a nice person who was estranged from his father for a long time. Like he had some not really rosy relationships with his father, apparently. They believe that he was kind of roped into something that he didn't quite understand. What does the coup attempt tell us about security in the DRC? That's after the break. On May 29th, 10 days after Malanga's eccentric plot, the DRC finally unveiled a new cabinet. The Prime Minister Judith Sumwinwa to Lucas team was unveiled on national television. The announcement was eagerly awaited as the east of the country continues to face a serious security crisis, particularly in the North Kivu province. Though the president was elected in December, delays in negotiations stalled the formation of the government for months. Now the cabinet will have to answer for the problems that led to the security breach. So, Shola, based on the picture that you're painting for us, this all sounds pretty poorly planned. But even though this coup attempt failed, these men still allegedly managed to breach the official residence of the president, which is in the heart of the capital. How did they manage to get as far as they did? Yeah, Malika, like you said, the coup feels like a really bad movie script playing out. First of all, they attacked the residence of Vital Kamehi, who now is second in command. But at the time, it wasn't quite clear what the purpose of that was. And then after that, they went to the, the president's residence, where it seemed they had already lost a lot of ammunition, according to analysts. Hmm. So they were really trapped. They didn't have like an escape plan. So the whole thing just seemed really amateurish. The question, like you say, is how did they then reach the number one residence, the number one location in Kinshasa. It's a question many in Kinshasa have been asking since it happened, including resident Ramazani Salabuni. What surprises us is that the palace of the nation has a lot of presidential guards, but these people accessed it easily and were well armed. However, until now, we don't know exactly what happened. We are waiting for official information on national television. Many analysts are saying perhaps it's possible that they had some kind of backing internally. Like we know how coups play out in Africa. Usually it's probably, you know, a senior officer of the military, someone who is in, on the inside, who knows the president's whereabouts, who knows everything about security. And since Christian Malanga was not in the military, it's possible that there was someone on the inside that helped him. Mm. It's possible that there was someone on the inside that could have given him support or promised support and just didn't show up. Now, who that person is, everyone is very reluctant to kind of put out a name, of course, because there's just no evidence. But people are pointing to, like, you know, top military figures. And it's possible that this person could have given him some kind of promise or backing. And then when it appeared that things weren't working out, this person then failed to, to show up. But in the end, we probably will never have an answer to that question. President Shisekedi hasn't really properly answered questions of how this happened in Kinshasa, how this happened in the number one most secure place in Kinshasa. Wow. Okay, so let me pause you there because we're speaking more than a week after this attempted coup. And you're saying that the president, Felix Tshisekedi, still has not addressed the public and explained how this happened? So far, we haven't seen any kind of statement from Felix Tshisekedi. Analysts are speculating as to why he's still quiet. Is it like, is he in shock? Is he trying to come up with a coherent explanation for this. He was just re-elected in December, and that election, many people say, was stolen. He doesn't have popular support at the moment, and people are saying perhaps he's just 
biding his time, waiting for this to be used as something to crack down on opposition leaders, something to crack down on NGOs. Human Rights Watch has called this a wave of repression. Most recently, it's called on the government to investigate a possible forced disappearance that took place just two days before the coup attempt. Gloria Senga, a prominent civil rights activist in Kinshasa, is still missing. We've already seen journalists arrested in the DRC in the past year for covering political issues, so people believe this is just one more arsenal in President Shisekedi's weapons cabinet that he's going to use and that he's just keeping quiet and waiting for the proper time to emerge and, and use this. So Shola, what are people exactly frustrated about? What is the discontent with his government? No, it's, it's the question almost is, what are people not frustrated about in the DRC? <laughs> wow. 100 million people, you know, in this country blessed with resources, this beautiful country, and this high inflation. A lot of people are out of jobs. A lot of people can't even travel safely in their own country. In the east of the DRC at the moment, probably the biggest problem that is facing people there now is the advance of M23. This is a, a rebel group that is believed by UN experts and some countries, including the US, to be backed by Rwanda. And the aim of this uh, rebel group is to take the DRC, to, to take power. And they've been advancing from the east for about two years now, and they've been moving quite rapidly in the past months. So this is a massive problem. People in the DRC are scared for their lives. People in the DRC don't have light. They don't have water, poor infrastructural arrangements. And now on top of it, this coup, in fact, most people were saying actually that this is just a kind of distraction. You're just trying to distract us from the real issues and we're not distracted. The coup is a masquerade to distract us. It's a lie. We're suffering and stuck. Others were saying, for example, people I spoke to who were in Goma were saying, like, we're happy that people in Kinshasa got shaken up. Like, this is what we've been experiencing oh, wow. uh, for a while now. So, yeah. So, wait, for context there, for many people, when they hear a story about the DRC, they think about the Eastern DRC. They think about what's happening in Goma, the fight between M23 fighters against the government. But this is not in the East. This is in Kinshasa, the, the, the capital, which is about 3,000 kilometers away from Goma. And so people in Goma who've been experiencing this violence for so long now were looking at what happened in the capital and saying, at least they can now relate to what we're feeling. Exactly. You know, this is not, the whole coup is not at all connected to the M23 situation or the situation with about 100 other armed groups in the East. And I think for a long time, Kinshasa has been kind of shielded from this. Obviously, like everyone in the country is scared of M23 advancing, but at the end of the day, it's in the East. It's, 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 it's a problem of the East. But now, at least for a little bit, no one came out. Uh, everyone stayed indoors. Mm -hmm. People were really scared. There was fear in the immediate aftermath, and it felt for the people in, in Goma, like, for once, the people in Kinshasa feel what we're feeling. Is there a feeling that this coup attempt took place because the military is so deeply involved with violence in the east of the country? Um, uh, th that's a good question. I, I think it's, when you look at it on one hand, it's it's probable, like, okay, they might be so uh, busy in the East that, you know, r resources are not as concentrated in Kinshasa, which is like the opposite end of Goma. But at the end of the day, when you look at the DRC, it's a massive country. It has 100,000 active troops. There's just no way that kind of argument would hold water, especially analysts have told me. When you consider that this area that was breached was the number one place to be guarded in Kinshasa. So I, I think many analysts would disagree with that argument. So Shola, pushing this forward, what do people expect to hear from their government after this occurred? What do people want to hear? People have been hearing from the military spokesman, Ikenge, 
a day after the attacks as well, the Ministry of Information was putting out a lot of messages saying, no, don't, no worries, we have this under control. But I think like the proper address televised press conference by Felix Shisekedi would likely put more people at ease. And also explaining what's going on with investigations behind the scenes like how, what happened in that space of time. That's one of the questions that people are asking, but also who were the people internally who were probably helping this army? I think holistically, people in the DRC are just seeking proper governance. They're just seeking peace and um, they're seeking a government that listens to them, no matter where they are in Kinshasa or in Goma. I think this is what most people are, are looking for. Shilda, thanks for giving us this window into what's happened in the DRC and what might happen next. Thank you for having me. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Marcos Bartolome and Tamara Kandaker. With Sonia Bagat, Chloe K. Lee, Menahel Navid, Doha Mossad, and me, Malika Bilal. It was edited by Alexandra Locke. The Take production team is Amy Walters, Ashish Malhotra, Catherine Newhan, Chloe K. Lee, David Enders, Doha Moshad, Khalid Sultan, Manahil Navid, Marcos Bartolome, Noor Wazwaz, Sariel Khalili, Sonia Bagat, Tamara Kandaker, and Zaina Badr. I'm your host, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back tomorrow.